Hey guys. Hey Bo. Uh, hi Bo. Ladies and gentle people, the bell has rung, therefore class has begun. Therefore, you should be seated, seated, ready, and excited to review everything we learned in electricity and magnetism in AP Physics C. Here we go. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. All right. Just like mechanics, I need you to just listen, okay? Maybe? Oh boy. All right. Let's get started. Coulomb's law, the electric force, the force between two charged particles, charge positive and negative, we have the law of charges. Unlike charges attract, like charges repel. In this particular case, we have the force between them. So K, Q1, Q2 over R squared, where K is Coulomb's constant, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth, uh, what is it, Newtons times meters squared over Coulombs squared. Q1, Q2, these are the two charges divided by R. Now R, R squared is the distance between the center of charges of the two charges. Not to be confused with the radius, and this is especially confusing because sometimes it is the radius. So R is not the radius by definition. It is the distance between the center of charges of the two charges, and it is sometimes the radius, which can be confusing. One confusing piece about this as well is that you need two charges, and if you change the charge of one of them, the electric force on both of the charges changes, because in order to have this electric force, you need two charges. The electric field is equal to the electric force per unit charge. That's a test charge, and the electric field is defined by a positive test charge, a small one at that, a small positive test charge. If you plug in the equation for Coulomb's law, one of the charges ends up, ends up canceling out, and you get for an electric, the electric field for a point charge is KQ over R squared. You guys do know that he posts all of his lecture notes at flippingphysics.com, right? You do realize you said the exact same thing last time. Oh. Some notes about electric field lines. Electric field lines always start at a positive charge and end at a negative charge, unless there are more positive or negative charges than the other, so they can either start or end at infinity. Uh, electric field uh, lines are never loops, and they are always normal to the surface. Right, at the, right next to the surface, they are always perpendicular or normal to that surface. Three different charge densities. Volumetric charge density, surface charge density, and linear charge density. Um, rho, sigma, and lambda. Charge per unit volume, charge per unit area, and charge per length. You need to know these charge densities. They're going to come up quite a bit in electricity and magnetism. Electric flux. The symbol is an uppercase phi, looks like an I with a circle in the middle of it, with a lowercase, I'm sorry, with a subscript of an uppercase E for electric field. So this is the electric flux. It is the um, integral of the electric field with the dot product with respect to uh, the area. Therefore, we have Ea cosine theta if there's a constant area, electric field, and angle. The, uh, the electric flux leads us to Gauss's law. Gauss's law, the electric flux. Now this is Gauss's law has to do with a Gaussian surface. Whenever you're using Gauss's law, you have to draw and identify your Gaussian surface, please. Gauss's law is the closed surface integral E dot dA is equal to the charge inside the Gaussian surface divided by E naught. Usually we use Gauss's law to figure out the electric field on something, that electric field, then in order to use Gauss's law, you choose a Gaussian surface such that the electric field is constant on the Gaussian surface. The dot product, so we have the cosine of the angle, therefore the angle needs to either be zero or 90 degrees in order to use um, Gauss's law, at least in this class. That's why we choose our Gaussian surface such that the theta is equal to either zero or 90 degrees. So please be very careful with the Gauss's law to make sure the electric field is constant on your Gaussian surface and the angle between the electric field and the area vector is either zero or 90 degrees, please. Remember, you use Gauss's law to figure out the electric field around a point particle or a char we use it to show that the electric field around any uh, spherical object is equal to the electric field caused by a point particle. And that is something that's important to know. You have to be able to, de to derive it. And sometimes they'll just ask you, what is the electric field around this particular uh, spherical object? And if they say, what is, don't derive it because you don't want to waste time on the AP test. That's the last thing you want to do. So simply, if they ask what is the electric field around this particular spherical object, then you can simply say it acts like a point charge and it's KQ over R squared. Certainly, if they ask you to derive it, you're going to have to use Gauss's law. 
electric potential energy, we have K, Q1, Q2 over R, electric potential energy. Again, in order to have electric potential energy, you have to have two charges, K, Q1, Q2 over R. Electric potential difference. Notice the relationship here between electric potential difference and electric potential energy and the electric field and the electric force. The electric potential difference is the change in the electric potential energy per unit charge, just like the electric field is the electric force per unit charge. It's a way to get rid of that test charge and just talk about the energy that exists in a particular space without the charge that could be there. And when you add the charge, then you would have the energy, but it's an energy that exists in a field, if you will, just like we have an electric field. And so we have the same thing. We could talk about the electric potential difference caused by a point charge. So it's the electric potential difference is, again, all we do is substitute in the equation for the electric potential energy and we end up with KQ over R. That is the electric potential difference for a point charge. And that's the electric potential difference between a point infinitely far away and a point R distance from our, test, from our point charge. So we can use that to figure out the electric potential difference between a point infinitely far away and a continuous charge distribution of distance R from a continuous charge distribution by simply taking our continuous charge distribution and breaking it up into little pieces dQ, which is all going to have an electric potential difference dV, which is K dQ over R. In other words, you end up having to take the integral for a ch continuous charge distribution. Please remember that electric potential difference is a scalar, that because it comes from energy, which is a scalar, unlike electric field, which is a vector, because electric force is a vector. The electric potential difference, by definition, is the negative of the integral of the electric field dot product with dr, with respect to position. In a constant electric field, that actually works out to be the negative times the electric field times the um, change in position. So electric potential difference is an important one in a constant electric field is equal to negative E delta D. A unit that often gets used on the AP test is one electron volt. The one electron volt is defined as 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Notice that electron volt sounds like it is a volt would be electric potential difference, but it is not. It is simply a measurement of energy. It's just a very small amount of energy. And we use that for describing very small amounts of energy. Capacitance is defined as the charge that can be carried, that can be stored on a capacitor per uh, electric potential difference for that capacitor. For a parallel plate capacitor, we have a, put the, an equation which we derived, which is the dielectric constant times E naught times the area of the two plates divided by D, the distance between the two plates. An important thing to realize about capacitance is it is it always positive, and this charge is the charge on one of the two plates. If you were to talk about the total charge in a capacitor, it's actually going to be zero because the two plates are going to carry the same amount of charge. Therefore, this charge is the charge either on the positive or negative plate, depending on whether you're talking about a negative or positive electric potential difference, but the capacitance by definition has to be positive. We have equations for capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel. We'll start with capacitors in series. A capacitor in series is simply equal to the inverse of the sum of the inverses of the capacitances of the various capacitors. And when you have capacitors in series, charge is the same and the electric potential difference is at. So when you have capacitors in parallel, it is simply adding the capacitors. You simply have the sum of the capacitors to get the equivalent capacitance. And for capacitors in parallel, the electric potential difference is the same and the charges add, again, for capacitors in parallel. And we derive the equation for the energy stored in a capacitor. The energy stored in a capacitor can be defined, we have actually three different equations, but it all has to do with whether you have charge, capacitance, and electric potential difference, which two of those you have. So we have three different equations and you should really know all three. Current. Current is defined as the derivative of charge as a function of time. Literally, the charge, the current is, if you could count the charges as they go by and time how long it would take, it is literally the charge per unit time. That is what current is. That's one of the two equations we have for current. We also have another equation for current. Another equation we have for current is equal to the charge carrier density multiplied by the charge per carrier multiplied by the drift velocity times the cross-sectional area. 
where n, the charge carrier density, is the number of charges per unit volume. Q is the charge on those charge carriers. V sub d, the drift velocity, is actually very small. It's an important piece to realize that the overall change in motion of the charges themselves is actually very small and in general. And the cross-sectional area is the area normal to the direction of travel, uh, of net travel of the drift velocity. Resistance. Electric potential difference equals the current times resistance is usually how you see it, but if you were to rearrange it to solve for the resistance, resistance equals the electric potential difference divided by the current. Not to be confused with resistivity. Resistance in terms of resistivity, resistivity would be rho. Resistance is equal to rho, the resistivity times the length divided by the cross-sectional area. So resistance is the resistance of a specific geometric object, which includes both the resistivity of the object, the length, and the cross-sectional area. Whereas resistivity is simply a material property. Three different equations for electric power. Current times electric potential difference, current squared times resistance, and electric potential difference squared divided by the resistance. Just like the energy stored in a capacitor, we have three different equations, but it really just depends on which two you have. This is the rate at which electric potential energy is being converted to heat and sound and light, depending on exactly what you are talking about in a specific case. EMF, or electromotive force, versus terminal voltage. Electromotive force, again, a misnomer. Sounds like a force, it is not. The electromotive force is the uh, ideal electric potential difference across a battery, whereas delta V sub T, the, electric pot uh, the terminal voltage, is the actual potential difference you get from a battery, what you would measure at the terminals of the battery. The only way to get the EMF out of a battery actually is to have a current equal to zero. If you look at the equation for the uh, terminal voltage, it's equal to the EMF across the battery minus the current through the battery times the internal resistance, lowercase r for the internal resistance. So again, the only way to get the terminal voltage equal to the EMF is if that current is equal to zero, and what's the point in that? You're not actually getting anything out of it. We can have resistors in parallel and resistors in series. When you have resistors in parallel, you have the equivalent resistance is equal to the inverse of the sum of the inverses of the resistances, where the electric potential difference is going to be the same and the currents add, again, when you have resistors in parallel. If you have resistors in series, that means that the resistances are simply going to add. You can have the sum of the resistances. And when, resistor, when you have resistors in series, you have the currents are going to be the same and the electric potential differences add. So it's reversed. Kirchhoff's rules. An example of when we would need to use Kirchhoff's rules are when we have two batteries in a circuit and it's hard to identify what the current directions are going to be, so on and so forth. When you use Kirchhoff's rules, it's the basic idea that at a junction, for example, at point A, that the currents into the loop are equal to the currents going out of the loop. When you add up all the currents going in, you're going to, those are going to be equal to the currents going out. And the electric potential difference around a loop, one of the other Kirchhoff's rule, is equal to zero. The electric potential difference around a loop is going to be equal to zero. What that's going to look like in this particular case is... When you're using Kirchhoff's rules, you have to pick a loop direction, pick your loop directions, and you have to pick a junction. You're always going to have one more loop than you need and one more junction than you need. You'll notice there's actually a loop that goes all the way around the outside, which I have yet to define, and we only need one of the junctions. Let's start with one of the loops. Let's start with loop A. So as you go around loop A, we'll start at EMF1. That's going to be positive because we're going in the direction of the loop. As you go in the direction of the loop, in the same direction of the current, as you go across a resistor, the electric potential is going to go down. So we have the negative electric potential difference across the resistor. Now notice that we're going opposite the direction of the positive versus negative of the EMF of 2. Therefore, going in that loop direction, the EMF is going to be equal to, we're going to have a negative EMF. Note the current is, independent, is irrelevant when we're talking about whether we're going positive or negative for the EMF. It only has to do with the direction of the loop versus the positive and negative terminals of the battery. And then, because for resistor 3, we're going opposite the direction of the current for our loop, then the electric potential difference is actually going to go up, and we have the positive electric potential difference across resistor 3. And then I just substitute in current times resistance for each of those, and that is our equation for loop A. 
Somehow I neglected to mention the main important piece there is that the electric potential difference around loop A is also equal to zero. Important, but I skipped it. Okay, uh, sorry. So the electric potential difference around loop B is also equal to zero. So as we go around loop B, now notice we're going in the same direction as going from negative to positive across the terminals of battery EMF2. So that's going to be positive as we go around loop B. And we are going in the direction of the current, the loop and the current direction are the same, so the electric potential is going to go down for both resistor 2 and resistor 3. So we end up with 0 is equal to the EMF 2 minus current 2 times resistor 2 minus current 3 times resistor 3. If we look at the first rule here, where the sum of the currents into and out of a junction are the same, if we look at junction A, we have current 1 going into junction A, current 3 going into junction A, and current 2 going out of junction A. In other words, current 1 plus current 3 is equal to current 2. So notice now that we actually have three equations that we need to solve simultaneously. Usually the way I will end up solving that is using row reduced echelon form on my calculator uh, and creating that matrix. matrix. Uh, that is, as far as I'm concerned, the easiest way to solve a problem like this. Next, we have a concept of an RC circuit, a circuit where we have both a resistor and a capacitor, and usually a battery, but we could, that would be charging a capacitor through a resistor in an RC circuit. You can also have discharging a capacitor through a resistor. Let's write down some of the equations. Charging a capacitor through a resistor, we end up with the charge as a function of time on the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the EMF times the quantity 1 minus e to the negative t over rc. You can also derive that the current as a function of time is equal to the EMF divided by the resistance times the e to the negative t over rc. Again, this is charging a capacitor through a resistor. It is important that you know how to derive these equations, but it is almost more important that you understand the limits, because the limits come up very often in problems. So for example, when you're charging a capacitor through a resistor, at time t is equal to zero, the initial charge of the capacitor is going to be equal to zero, and the current is going to be at a maximum. You can see that in the equations, but that also should make sense to you, because initially there's no charge on the capacitor, therefore the electric potential difference across the capacitor is going to be equal to zero, therefore the electric potential difference across the resistor is going to be at a maximum, therefore the current across the resistor is going to be at a maximum. On the other end, at times approximately equal to infinity, we have fully charged the capacitor, therefore the charge is equal to Q max, and therefore the electric potential difference across the capacitor is going to be pretty much equal to the potential difference across the battery, therefore there's going to be no current across the resistor because there's none left. The electric potential difference across the resistor is equal to zero. You could also talk about discharging a capacitor through a resistor. Discharging a capacitor through a resistor, we end up with our equations for the charges function of time, which is going to be equal to the charge initial times e to the quantity negative t over rc. And the charge is, or current as a function of time is going to be equal to the negative the charge current initial times e to the negative t over rc. Negative simply because the current has changed directions when we're discharging versus charging the capacitor. Now, Again, the limits are very important. At time t equals zero, we're going to have the maximum current and the maximum charge because we start out with the most amount of charge on the capacitor. We're going to be releasing that through the circuit. Therefore, the current is going to be at a maximum and it's going to decrease as a function of time. The charge is going to be at a maximum and decrease as a function of time. And both are going to end at zero at the end. You should be aware of how to derive all these equations. You should know the, the limits of all these equations. And you should also be familiar with the shapes of these different graphs. Please. Another thing, the time constant. One other thing that we need to talk about is the time constant. The time constant for an RC circuit is the resistance times the capacitance. It is literally the time it takes to get a 63.2% change in whatever you're talking about right here. Unfortunately, this number, 63.2%, is a very important number and one that you should memorize. I'm not a fan of memorization, but it is an important one. And the idea that I'm not a fan of memorization, here is where it comes from. If you plug in the time constant, Rc, in for your time, you'll get 1 minus e to the negative 1, which is 0 0.632 or 63.2%. That's where it comes from. If you forget, you can just do that in your calculator and use your brain. Lecture notes are available at flippingphysics.com. Please enjoy lecture notes responsibly. <laughs>